Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Public Affairs, Public Access. I'm your guest host, uh, David Hutzelman, and uh, on my show, we usually talk about uh, politics and public policy from a libertarian perspective. Uh, and I'm often asked, what in the world is a libertarian perspective anyway? Well, just for a quick rundown, uh, libertarians are usually people that, uh, fe uh, f that uh, favor a very free market economy, uh, not the over-regulated crony capitalism economy that we have today. Uh, we're also very uh, tolerant and accepting of other people's personal choices and lifestyles and don't believe anybody should be uh, persecuted for actions that don't harm other people. And from a foreign policy, we're probably uh, pretty sk skeptical about uh, imposing military, uh, imposing our values by military force on other uh, nations' internal politics. So. Uh, We'd like to stay away from that, that kind of nation-building kind of actions. Uh, now, of course, libertarians come in a number of flavors. Uh, uh, a number of libertarians would uh, not even uh, want to consider voting uh, because they think that's uh, using aggression against your, uh, your fellow voters. Uh, but tonight, uh, we're uh, having a discussion with some what uh, is known in the trade as uh, capital L libertarians as opposed to small L libertarians. Capital L libertarians are people in the libertarian party who believed in political action as a way of making a better society for all of us. Uh, that includes me, and that includes my two guests tonight. Uh, I'd like you to meet them. Uh, first of all is our libertarian party candidate for railroad commission in 2016. Sitting to my left, Mark Miller. Mark's a retired professor of uh, petroleum engineering from the UT and an entrepreneur in the oil and gas industry for the last uh, couple decades. So uh, probably the only well-qualified person this year on the ballot for the Texas Railroad Commission. He's also the author of a book uh, which has just been, uh, well, it's been published for some time, if we can zero in on that. And uh, holding the book is uh, my friend, there's the book, uh, the Oil and Gas and Texas Railroad Commission. And Mark will explain to you why uh, maybe the Texas Railroad Commission is not an apt name for the regulatory agency. And my friend Alan Vogel, who is sitting across from me, Alan's a former uh, uh, candidate for governor of the Texas Libertarian Party. As a matter of fact, the first candidate for governor of the Texas Libertarian Party back in 1978. And so he's here tonight to uh, participate in the interview as well. And uh, Please, uh, as viewers, please don't forget that we have a call-in line, and if you'd like to at any time ask questions of either of these guests, please just ring us up and we'll uh, interrupt and try to make a place for your questions. So let's get uh, started. I'm going to turn it over to Mark for a minute, and I'm going to uh, just ask him a question to start it off. Uh, since, uh, as we're going to find out, that the Texas Railroad Commission doesn't really have anything to do with railroads, but everything to do with oil and gas, what is there to give the average voter uh, an incentive to even look into what the Texas Railroad Commission does, let alone who's the best candidate for them? Well, well David, I, I usually tell folks a couple, couple of things in the answer to that question. First of all, uh, oil and gas is Texas' most important industry. So if you care about the bad things you think that industry is doing, or if you really like the good things that industry is doing, either way you should care about oil and gas in Texas. It's part of our history, part of our, our culture. But the other piece of it is that as we've begun to develop these shale resources, uh, the fracking boom, as we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about more uh, during the show, is that a lot of the uh, oil and gas activities are starting to come closer and closer to where people live. Historically, an awful lot was in rural East Texas, rural West Texas, but now you've got places like the Barnett Shale where oil and gas operations are getting close to communities and it's impacting where people live. They're worried about their groundwater. They're worried about, in some cases, earthquakes. Um, they're worried about the fact that they're making a lot of noise and drilling on your property next door. Um, there's, tearing up the roads. And tearing up the roads. Uh, South Texas, it started. A lot of it's still rural. It wouldn't surprise me, actually, if over time a lot of that shale resource uh, activity gets closer to Houston. Houston's always getting bigger, the suburbs. Uh, the shales move in that direction. San Antonio will probably be affected as well. So, so you've got major areas of the state where there will be more and more impact 
uh, on oil, of oil and gas operations on where people live. Okay, so people ought to pay more attention to what the railroad they commission is doing. Absolutely ought to pay more and attention. There couldn't be a better way to do that than to read your book. That would be a great start. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a short book, so yeah, it's easy to read. Yeah, it's pretty short. I, I think the average voter probably would maybe not get all the way through it, but there's a couple good chapters in the back if you just want to see what. In fact, I always recommend read chapter four. If you don't read anything else, read okay. chapter four. All right, well, one of the um, things then that I just needed to follow up on, uh, now that we know that the oil, uh, that the Texas Railroad Commission does have some impact on the average voter, uh, what distinguishes uh, your campaign uh, from those of your uh, opponents? Now, just to give you an idea of who his opponents are, uh, one of the opponents is a uh, country and western band leader turned uh, investment advisor who is the Republican uh, candidate, and the other one uh, is a school teacher, I think, from uh, West Texas. Is that right, uh, mm -hmm. Alan? East Texas, yeah. I think. East Texas, okay. So uh, when it comes to really knowing what's going on the, in the uh, oil and gas industry, you really don't have any competition. But tell us about what distinguishes you from these two gentlemen. There, there, there's a couple things. One you, you've already hinted at is that a lot of what the Railroad Commission deals with is, is highly technical. It's about protecting property rights, it's about protecting groundwater, it's about public safety. And um, it's not so much policy as it is understanding what a lot of the really technical issues are that, that face oil and gas operators and face people that are adjacent to oil and gas operators. The other piece is that as a libertarian, we have a unique focus on peop everybody's rights. What you're going to find is the Republicans are almost always knee-jerk defenders of oil and gas. And in fact, sitting railroad commissioners today will openly admit to the fact that they have a dual mandate. That is, they are both champions of oil and gas as well as its regulator. That doesn't make any sense to me. First of all, I don't, as, as you know, us libertarians, we don't believe government ought to be a champions of any industry, uh, even if it is the biggest one and the, the strongest one in the state. So I think that's totally inappropriate. And, and so the Republicans will always go along that. And they get all their money from oil and gas. So frankly, it's not surprising. The Democrats, on the other hand, usually will be knee-jerk anti-oil and gas. Uh, they don't, they'll, they'll tend, as well as the Green Party candidate, who's also on the ballot, they will want to shut down fracking. They will want to put huge restrictions. And as a libertarian, what we bring to the table is everybody has rights. Mineral rights owners have rights. Oil companies have rights. Surface properties have rights. And one of the issues that I think is really important and an issue we libertarians don't talk about very much is what happens when those rights start to conflict. How, how do we resolve a lot of those issues? Okay. Well, Alan, do you have anything uh, you'd like to? Well, one of the things that, that I uh, looked into when I discovered you were going to be here in town was a little bit about the history of the Railroad Commission. And uh, I, I see that it's 125 years old now, and mm -hmm. it's apparently is one of the early uh, uh, establishments of the progressive movement back in the 19th century, which was trying to uh, regulate and improve society in some way. And they, they started to establish boards and commissions for, for promoting those. And it seems like that uh, immediately the industries that were being regulated uh, captured those regulatory boards. And, and uh, essentially, once they captured those boards, that, that really was an important element in what we are today calling crony capitalism. So uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could give us a little background on how the Railroad Commission fits that pattern. Or does it fit that pattern? It, it does, and it's a very important question. The, the, the problem of regulatory capture, as you alluded to, is a, is a real problem. What, what's interesting about the Railroad Commission, just as a little bit of a side, was there was a big debate when it first formed as to whether they should be elected or appointed. And part of the idea about them being elected was that it was more likely that they would be responsive to the people and not to the industries that they were regulating. Quite the opposite turned out to be true, as usual, because today, because so few people know about the Railroad Commission, where are they going to get their money to run for office? They're going to get it from the people who support them and give them, and who has a lot of money, oil and gas companies. Not the companies, but people who work for oil and gas companies. And so there, it's, not, it's not really surprising that it has been captured, and it is captured, 
and the legislature doesn't want to seem to do anything about it. Uh, they don't even want to change the name. Um, and we can talk, there's a lot of reasons why that might be, but uh, if, if you just change the name people to something like the Energy Resources Commission, people might pay more attention. They, they see railroads and they go, we don't have any problems with the railroads. I don't, I don't care about the railroads. When did they stop uh, regulating railroads back in the... It's really been about, uh, any significant regulations have been two, three decades. Okay. There was a little teeny tiny bit that was finally taken away, I, I think, maybe 10 years ago. I see. So there yeah. hasn't really been railroad regulation for a very, very long time. And they used to regulate trucking regulation, all the interstate, intrastate yep. trucking regulation. At, at one time, they even set bus fares all around the state. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't know. It. Okay, well. And so yeah. th there, was a, there was a huge uh, idea that... that uh, and, and, you know, you, in some ways you can't fault industry for saying, look, these guys have a big impact on us. We have to somehow work with them, you know. And they, they, they tend to be colleagues and, it's sort of, you know, from the standpoint of their disciplinary uh, activities and so on and so forth. And it's not too surprising to me that that's the case. I don't, frankly, not sure how we change that. Texas, we, have a, we can change it because they're not appointed by the governor. They're elected. The voters can say at any time, every two years, they can say, we don't like that. Well, one of the ways you've suggested changing it, I think, is to change the name. First. Change the name, absolutely. It's been recommended twice, now a third time, by the Texas Sunset Commission. Um, there are very powerful forces in the Texas legislature led by a certain a former speaker of the House from Midland, mm. whose daughter just happens to sit on the commission, um, <laughs> that he's the one that pretty much keeps it from advancing even to the House floor. Something like calling it the Texas Oil and Gas Commission or something? The, the name that the uh, Sunset Commission has recommended, which is one that I believe is a good one, is called the Texas Energy Resources Commission. Oh, okay. The reason I like that is because the Railroad Commission does in fact regulate mining and uranium uh, excuse me, coal and uranium mining in the state as well. Okay. So its activities are not 100% oil and gas, although predominantly it's it's oil and gas. So, so all the lignite mines in Texas are come under the uh, auspices Commission. of the, uh, the Railroad Commission. Commission. I'll be darned. Okay. Yeah, usually most of those most of those things are actually federal regulations that the Railroad Commission is given authority to oversee. Hmm. Okay. Um, but yes, they, they do they do fall under the uh, railroad commission. Well, what kind of people usually get elected to the railroad commission? It, it, you know, it's 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 kind of uh, unusual to see a petroleum engineer, somebody who's actually experienced in the field, uh, running for this office. I believe it seems like they're mostly politicians. Uh, the last petroleum engineer to sit on the commission was 50 years ago. <laughs> Uh, he, he actually was a very interesting guy that I, that I got to meet because he was a University of Texas graduate, master's degree in petroleum engineering, and uh, actually was really the moving force behind one of the most important regulations they ever promulgated, which was to stop the flaring of natural gas. Um, since that time, it's always been politicians. Um, first of all, that's not any surprise. It's a very powerful political office. Some people think it's even more powerful than the governor. Uh, because it has real authority. Our, our governor is, is, has not that much authority. Um, so they, and they also tend to be people who aspire to higher office. So it's looked upon in many respects as a stepping stone to other things. And frankly, the people that are there now, I would not be surprised. Uh, Christy Craddock, who is the chairman, is up for election in two years. As Tom Craddock's daughter, I would be surprised if she doesn't aspire to some higher office. The newest commissioner is a guy named Ryan Sitton from Houston. Uh, he's very young. He's only 40 years old. Again, I would be very surprised if he did not aspire. He's the closest to a technical person they've had in a long, long time. Uh, he's not a petroleum engineer, but he is an engineer. Uh, and it worked in sort of the surface facilities area in oil and gas. So he, he actually um, is the closest to a technical person they've had. But uh, by and large, they've been uh, politicians, mostly uh, lawyers. I'm curious. Oh, go ahead. Could you give us a little bit of information about your background that particularly qualifies you for this position? Well, uh, first of all, I've, I've been a petroleum engineer my whole life. I usually tell people I've been oil field trash since 1972. Uh, 
my campaign manager asked me whether oil field trash was a term of endearment, and I said, yes, just like Army Brat. <laughs> it sounds like it's not, but it is. We're proud of that, uh, of that term. So I've, I've worked, I started out in the field doing field work, did reservoir engineering, what we call reservoir engineering, production engineering, worked for a company called Getty Oil Company. Remember J. Paul mm -hmm, Getty? Mm -hmm. I used to send faxes to J. Paul Getty when I was a young engineer in their corporate office. We bought you. What's that? We bought you. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Texaco. Yeah, I know. I know. I, you and I can have a long discussion about that story. I have lots of <laughs> some scoop from friends of mine. And um, decided uh, to go back to graduate school. Um, was having such a good time in graduate school, I just stayed on for a PhD and was having such a good time doing that, I decided to take a teaching job. So I taught petroleum engineering at UT Austin for 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, I turned 50, my kids were growing up, I decided it was time to go back and do real work instead of academic work and went out as a consultant and did a lot of consulting work, a lot, especially in Mexico, did a lot of work in Mexico for several years. And um, as David alluded to, I had a, a small uh, software company uh, right before I retired that uh, provided oil and gas uh, software. Okay. So I, I have a lot of inside knowledge about the technical issues uh, facing uh, the commission. I'm curious as to what, uh, first of all, uh, there's three railroad commissioners, right? That's correct. What kinds of... Uh, life and death decisions do these three, three people make? And if they don't have any technical background, what basis do they use for making them? Is this just strictly a political decision? You, you ask the governor or the party chairman who you're supposed to uh, support in this, uh, in this whatever dispute that you're all working on? Well, a lot of the issues, as in any regulatory agency, start with some technical people that have hearings, right? So there's an issue that comes up, for example, around well spacing or around whether somebody's uh, groundwater is being contaminated by a well. And so there's usually a study done by the technical staff. Um, and I, I got plenty to say about their technical staff. They're un underpaid and uh, they're not, I mean, the, the highest paid person at the Railroad Commission makes maybe $120,000 a year, which is kind of like starting salaries in the oil and gas business. Um, and so there's a technical and they make a recommendation and it's very rare that the commissioners will override those technical hmm. recommendations. Um, I, I, I do think they are very behind the times technically and I think that's one of the problems we have today is that it's going to be really hard for them to stay up. Technologies are improving rapidly. This, all the shale stuff is brand new technologies. A lot of these regulations go back to the 30s, and as you might expect, they evolve extremely slowly. And so they're mostly setting policy and rubber stamping what happens down below. They're very seldom do they override what the mm -hmm. staff said. So unless you have somebody there that actually knows something, everybody else is up just there saying, well, yeah, I'm, fine, go ahead. Let me, let me give you an example of a situation. I had a, a, a person who hired me to sit in on a hearing that was actually a conflict between a major oil company and the Texas land office. You may not know this, but the largest royalty owner in Texas is the Texas Land Office. It goes to the college fund or something? It's the, well, they don't, they, 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 they do the public school funds. Okay. public right? school fund, permanent school fund. The, the, that's right. The, the universities have their own oh, fund. Okay. It's separate. But anyway, they have a lot of property. They have one petroleum engineer. They have one petroleum engineer. So there was a hearing in which they were contesting how far apart the wells should be. Now, this becomes a really important question for a royalty owner, which I, we can get into later if you want to, but it's a, it's, it's a very important economic question. And the land office wanted the commission to set a smaller spacing, and the oil company wanted them to set a larger spacing. They were, the land office was outgunned. Hmm. The land, in my opinion, the land office was correct, but you had all these experts from a major oil company, they spent a lot of money they had five experts and an attorney there for two hours. And it's when you get a very slick, and then you get people who are doing the hearings, one of them's a lawyer and the other one's a technical person. If the technical person doesn't sort of get what the real issues are, those big guns just 
roll over you. <laughs> and, and I think this is one of the reasons people think the Railroad Commission should be a little bit more powerful. And we can talk about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> that we libertarians are reluctant to give government more power. Um, but when you're, I tell people, if you're facing Exxon Mobil in either a court of law or down at the Railroad Commission, you're probably going to lose. <laughs> and I think that's, I think that's part of the problem. I see. Very good. Okay. Well, you have something else? Oh, I, oh. I just thought I'd, I'd toss out this quote that I ran across when I was researching this subject. Uh, going back to 1892, uh, George Clark ran against uh, James Hogg at the uh, beginning of the era of the Railroad Commission, and he was running as a uh, independent Jeffersonian Democrat, uh, which is kind of like a libertarian. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he lost, but he. this is what he said about the Texas Railroad Commission. Wrong in principle, undemocratic, and unrepublican. Commissions do no good, they do no harm, their only function is to harass. I regard it as essentially foolish and essentially vicious. <laughs> have any comment on that? <laughs> I, I, I can't disagree with it. Uh, the, um, it's, it's hard to bring that quote into a modern era for a couple of reasons, which we can talk about. Um, but he's, he's in effect correct. The, the, the idea behind, and this is where I come down with, the idea behind a, the progressives had for more regulations is that you could hire smart people who would be above cronyism and they could take care of it for us. So we're just going to give the power to these smart people. Scientific government. Scientific government. And of course what we know is that that failed. <laughs> so I think that's what he was talking about was going to happen because pretty soon you think you can control that stuff. And those of us that have worked in the free market know you can't control the free market. You, you simply can't. Uh, I mean, you can. You end up with Russia, <laughs> right, or Venezuela. And none of those are desirable outcomes. And so I think that's what he's talking about. One of the things that I talk about in the book, um, Alan, is whether regulatory agencies could s perhaps serve a more quasi-judicial role. In other words, a place to get recourse. Because the courts today, if you were to go to court and had a dispute, like I said earlier, with ExxonMobil, you, 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 ain't, you don't have the resources to fight ExxonMobil. But if there's kind of somebody on your side who can help you navigate that and kind of look out for your interests and do part of pushing things in a more desirable, maybe that's a good thing. I, do, I don't know. But it seems to me if we can move regulatory agencies away from what, what I call in the book a command and control paradigm, which is what I think what he was talking about is when you tell industry what to do, that's when you get into trouble. But rather say, look, when you, get, you guys stepped out of line here, you harmed those people's uh, groundwater, right? You intruded on their uh, property rights, you, and, and there needs to be a way to get recourse that Unfortunately, it's very cumbersome in our court system. Our court system has gotten out of whack because you and I don't have you and I don't have a big voice if, if we're going against a big company. We we don't. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. So how how do we get that power back? There's nothing within the Railroad Commission that allows that kind of a process today. Is there is, there is a little bit, and I think they could do a whole lot better. Is what I what I've been saying. They do have a quasi. There is a role of hearings, and in fact. If there's a hearing, they have this in their, if there's a hearing and the other side is not represented, somebody in the, on the commission staff is asked to take up that side of the case, mm -hmm. all right, if they're not represented. But they're, they're, it's not strong enough. It's, mm -hmm. In other words, they don't have the technical expertise to really uh, reconcile the issues. There's a, uh, there's a case, very famous, it's been in the papers, a guy named Lipsky up in Weatherford. And his uh, water well started producing gas. And uh, he blamed it on uh, some nearby uh, Barnett shale wells. Railroad Commission did two or three studies, concluded that it was not the problem. He's actually being sued by the operator because he got on the news and lit his well on fire. And they're suing him for defamation. It's for slander. 
And so he's got a countersuit against him. When I read the Railroad Commission report, I'm a very technical person. It was horrible. Had that been a report written by one of my graduate students, I would have sent it back. I said, I, I don't understand it. Your case is not made. And, and, but, at the, but they concluded that the operator, and I don't know whether the operator is the problem or not. You can't really tell when you read the report. It's just technically lacking. So one of the proposals that I, that I put in the book was whether the Railroad Commission ought to use more outside expertise. Why try to have that expertise in-house? It doesn't make any sense. Texas has geologists, engineers, geophysicists, very experienced people in, our, in academia, doing consulting. What, why, why don't we just hire them to do these kinds of studies instead of in-house? I think the some people will say, well, the consultants will be more crony captured than the bureaucrats. I don't think so. <laughs> I really don't think so. If I'm a consultant, the last thing I want to do is put my name on a report that turns out to be wrong. I'm not, I don't want to do that. That ruins my reputation. If you work for the Railroad Commission, there's no downside to a bad report. Yeah. Well, back, uh, I remember when <clears throat> I first became aware of the Railroad Commission, which was quite some time ago, but uh, one of the things they used to engage in was uh, allowable days of uh, production. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I understand it, that same uh, mechanism was adapted by OPEC uh, as an international way of limiting uh, the amount of uh, crude oil that made to the, gave to the market, which kind of certainly lends some theory to the fact that it's certainly not a pro-consumer uh, agency and is very much a crony capitalism uh, endeavor, even though I think the allowable days have gone by the boards, right? Yeah, it went by the board. They still have the authority to do it. Okay. They have not exercised it since the mid-70s. Um, but up until for about four decades, uh, the Texas Railroad Commission controlled the world price of oil by restricting production out of Texas. The, the theory was that they had they had authority from the legislature over what's called conservation. And technically there's, you can make a bit of an argument why there needs to be some sort of regulation over that. We could argue about whether that should be the case or not, but there's a technical reason why if you've got a huge number of operators, it's kind of like the, the tragedy of the commons, right, mm -hmm. uh, problem. So they controlled then individual wells to conserve ultimate production, but that led to, cons to uh, conservation for market forces. And so the Railroad Commission for a number of decades would say, do a study and say, this is the market demand, okay? So that's how much we can produce in the state. And then, then the big buyers would get together and decide how they would divvy it up and the Railroad Commission would put a stamp on it. All right, well you and I both know f from studying economics that when you say that's the demand and therefore that's the production we're gonna allow, you basically have set the price. Okay. All right, because price follows that, and and you know if if there was more supply, the price would would go down. Now David Prindle in his book that we talked about earlier um, said one of the theories is that it was payback for the Civil War, that we made the the the, the Yankees pay extra for oil. Uh -huh. So in other words, it, the idea was Texas benefited because we were an we were an exporter, right? In effect, that we we benefited more by that by that price controls. He also tells a story that every year there would be this big conference where the major oil companies would come sit with the railroad commissioners and give talks and the big company executives would get up and s praise the railroad commission as being the epitome of a free market regulation. <laughs> <laughs> All the time knowing good and well that was not true. Uh, so fortunately that no longer is the case. So. Um, there are still restrictions on a per well basis, but those are meant to prevent or minimize drainage across boundaries. So if you and I have yeah. properties on either side, we, our, we, we have to fairly share them. Sure, the some of that uh, I think was uh, motivated by the confusion or unknowability sometimes of underground property rights. Yes. Are you for, uh, do you support forced unitization of fields? I do not. Um, I, I think that um, there, there, are, there are plenty of good arguments for forced unitization. I am very reluctant 
to force somebody into an agreement. Okay. Um, usually the way the force unitizations go though, it's it's not so bad. It's like when you get 90% of the people to sign up, the other 10% have mm -hmm. to go along. Mm -hmm. There are some things going on that are almost like forced unitization. If you talk to a lot of the royalty owners and they're not real happy about it, it has something to do with how horizontal wells. Yeah, and the, the length of some of these horizontal wells, how do people know where those things are going? Uh, do they, obviously they must cross property boundaries. Um, they don't, they're not allowed to cross property rallies oh, without right? the rights. Oh, okay. Now, there are some, this is the, the sort of what we're getting into, that let's say you've got some property here and I've got a piece here. There is some way that they can let you drill over here and go through this property to get oh, over to, get to, to that property. one. Okay. Uh, I don't think that's right. <laughs> I, I, I think the person who owns the, the subsurface you rights, buy an easement. you better get an easement. Yeah, and you better pay for it. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, uh, and, but they drill these wells quite long distances. Yeah, I understand. There's, I was looking at some wells just the other day that were seven, 8,000 feet lateral length. So they went down 11,000 feet and then out over 7,000 feet. That's over a mile and a half. Uh huh. Wow. So they, and, and what they do with these uh, in the shale wells is they fracture them all along that 7,000 mm -hmm. feet. They, so they put, they do fracking, they do hydraulic fracturing maybe every 50 or 100 feet along that lateral. Can we talk about fracking a little bit? I, mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, your book is subtitled Lessons for Regulating a Free Society. And there are many people that are saying fracking is uh, causing earthquakes and is terrible. And uh, could you give us a true scope on that? What is fracking and what is it, what's uh, the harm of it? Um, I'll, I'll get to the earthquakes in a okay. second. Right. That, that's a, a bit of a secondary issue, but let me describe what fracking is to start out with. Um, we've been hydraulically, fr fracking is a, a shorthand for hydraulic fracturing, we've been, which we've been doing for many, many, many decades. What's new today is what we've learned in these shales is that we can drill these long horizontal wells and put a fracture, a hydraulic fracture, all along it. So it's really what we call in the industry massive hydraulic fracturing. There's a lot of sand, a lot of water. People ma imagine this huge underground explosion. It's not that at all. What you're doing is creating high enough pressure to instigate a crack, and then the high pressure, you keep it up until that crack propagates out and you fill the crack with some, what's called propant. We were talking about that earlier. Some material that holds it open. It grows vertically a little bit, not very far. And so the fear that those cracks will go up into the groundwater is just not true. Um, unless you were really close to the groundwater, it would not. And we're, we tend to be thousands of feet away. And there are regulations of, that you can't do that. The real danger of the, for the groundwater, which is what a lot of people worry about, is where the wellbore penetrates through the groundwater going down because there's a piece of pipe, you cement it, and we've been protecting groundwaters for 100, 200 years. How often do you hear about an oil well contaminating groundwater? Is it, you don't hear about it. Is it never? Of course not. Accidents happen, problems happen, people take shortcuts and should fix them, but it's not, it's not like this big, huge problem. The biggest contamination of groundwater in Texas comes from uh, gasoline storage tanks. By far and away, that's the, hu that's the big problem. It's not fracking and it's not drilling. Yeah. So, the, the, and in fact, the EPA recently came out with a study that said there's no evidence that there's any widespread contamination of groundwater from fracking. It's just not happening. The EPA, who would say the EPA, you know, the Obama administration EPA said this. Um, <clears throat> So that, that is an overblown fear. I understand people's fear, I get it, because you're putting stuff down in the ground that's got some chemicals in it that, that you should be concerned with, um, but it's just really not that big a problem. Um, the one thing that is happening, which is indirectly related, is earthquakes. Now, earthquakes are not occurring because of the fracking. Earthquakes are occurring where they are they're related to, when, when we produce oil and gas, there's a lot of water that comes with it. Some of it's the water we injected, some of, but most of it's water that comes from the natural formation. And it's nasty water. 
It's not fresh water. It's terrible water. You wouldn't put it on the ground. You wouldn't put it in the ocean. You have to do something with it. And so the, the way we've been dealing with it for a very long time is to dispose of that water in very deep formations. So we go way down below everything and we put the water. Texas has sediments, sedimentary rocks everywhere. So the water's going down into here. In some cases, there's 7,500 of these wells in Texas, but in a few cases there have been locations where the injection of the water has triggered the movement of an underground fault and caused some earthquakes. In Oklahoma, the problem is bigger. There's a certain part of Oklahoma where they've had some very serious earthquakes, some up to magnitude four, which start to get more serious. The ones in Texas have generally been down around three, but they're related to the underground water injection. It's real. The, the, um, we've known it for a long time. It's, we've known it. The science behind it has been there. Uh, when they filled Lake Mead, it triggered earthquakes. All right, so you put some stresses on the earth and things happen. Um, so we've known about it for a very long time. People are scared of earthquakes, obviously. And so the question is what you do about it. And um, in my view, it's really simple. Um, if you have a well that's causing earthquakes, you have to stop. Don't put the water there because you're disturbing your neighbors. To me, an earthquake is a form of trespass. Right? I don't. I don't care why. It's a. It's a form of trespass. So if that, if your well is the cause of the earthquakes, the Railroad Commission has been very slow to even admit the possibility that there is, and they have yet to attribute any injection, any earthquakes to injection in Texas. And I, and I think they're wrong. There's some world-class experts at the University of Texas, at SMU, at the USGS, that disagree with the Railroad Commission. And I'm not quite sure how their staff came to a different conclusion. Have I read about uh, some technology that's being, I'm not sure where in which formations and all, that they're talking about recycling uh, fracking water? They are. And it's, it's doable now. It's a little bit expensive, but the price is coming down. I've actually heard some environmentalists say they don't think that's a good idea. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason they don't think it's a good idea, in fact, the oil companies think it's a good idea because okay. they're short of water. They're always having to buy yeah, water. I would think that that would... No, no, no. They, they think it's a really good idea. Um, but the, I heard a guy uh, from, I don't know, Sierra Club or someplace say, look, this water is terrible. If, if you treat it on the surface, you've got to truck it somewhere. You've got to have pipes. You've got to have valves. Those are the things that leak. He said the safest place is to put it Way Keep down. it in the ground. Keep it way underground, away from people. Oh, okay. You know, away from people, away from stuff. Oh, it's not that they were objecting to the injection itself. It's just that... Uh, it's just they thought it was the, more dangerous to yeah, deal with... Uh -huh. I mean, he would rather we didn't produce it at all. Yeah, but, I'm sure that was... So, so but short of that, yeah, okay. his preference, his personal preference was deep well injection as opposed to cleanup. Because oh, okay. he Interesting. thought the cleanup was more risky. Hmm. And he, he may be right. Yeah, okay. He may be right. But yeah, there's a lot of interest because there's a lot of water that's bought. In fact, that was one of the big issues during the fracking boom because we were in the midst of a drought. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the fracking boom ended and so did the drought. So we don't hear that discussion any longer. But oil companies were buying fair amounts of fresh water around the state. It turned out to be not as much as people thought. In fact, it was less than we put on, on golf courses. <laughs> uh, but it's a still a lot. It's still a lot of water, mm -hmm. and so when we were in a drought, people were going, "Wait a minute! They're sucking up all of our water," and uh, that was another issue that came up a lot. Alan, the the oil business is uh, it's a real boom and bust business, and uh, we've gone through this several times, and I guess we always will. Uh, what uh, what kind of problems uh, are we having uh, right now? I guess we're in a bit of a bust. Uh, what kind of problems are we having, and how can the Railroad Commission uh, uh, react to those? That's a good, that's a good question. There, there are, uh, during the bust, of course, a lot of people going out of business, companies going out of business, people laid off. Um, there have been a number of proposals for things the Railroad Commission could do, uh, most of which I would oppose. Um, I tend to believe in economic cycles if, unless they're imposed by government, and these are not imposed by government. These are normal economic cycles, and I think we interfere with them at, 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 at it's risky to interfere with the normal e economic cycles. Um, now, what are some of the problems that are real? One of them is uh, what, what we call orphaned wells. 
uh, when you have a well that no longer is able to be produced, you are required to plug it. And you're required to plug it for a very good reason because you're required to plug it to protect the groundwater like we were talking before. You've got that penetration and you can imagine if you've got a hole that's still open, it, it could rust and eventually you could get leakage and you could contaminate somebody's drinking water. So there's a good reason to say, look, you, you drill a hole through the groundwater, you need to plug it. When these companies go bankrupt, um, they don't plug the wells, they just leave them and there's nobody to go after. And uh, so there's a program the Railroad Commission has to to abandon these wells with money they collect ostensibly from a bond that the um, operators pay. Unfortunately, the legislature set the bonds too low for people that have a large number of wells and therefore there's not enough money. So there's 10,000 probably going on more like 12,000 of these wells before we're all said and done that need to be abandoned today. They're sitting there waiting, needing to be abandoned and there's not enough money. It's going to require a couple hundred million dollars. Don't we have a rainy day fund to take care of that? Uh, there's money in the rainy day fund if the legislature would see fit to put, take the money. So they could, and, I, and that's one of the things I would use the rainy day fund for. Now, I don't appropriate any money, and so part of the problem with being an executive position is you're not charged of the purse. Rural Commission's budget is pretty low. It's like $75 million a year or something. It's not very much money for everything. But there's a big bully pulpit. And I really don't understand why the commissioners aren't out telling the people of Texas about this problem and cajoling. I mean, that's what you do when you're the executive, right? You cajole the legislature <laughs> to do what you think they should do. That's your job, to tell them what you think they should do. And I think they've been slow on the uptake. So they ought to be down there telling the legislature in no uncertain terms, we need some money. You know, the only time I ever hear about the Railroad Commission is during an election season. And after that, I forget who the Railroad Commissioner is because they, they never make any appearances. I take it you're going to do something different. Uh, I, w I would be very much in, in the public. Uh, they, they make appearances in the oil and gas circles. Oh. They do very little uh, publicly. And so I think it would be very important for the next commissioner. And uh, if and when I'm elected commissioner, that's exactly one of the things I plan to do is to be a whole lot more publicly out there calling for a name change, for example, calling for these things to change. This is where one commissioner, you could say, well, the other two could outvote you, but I don't, I don't care. I'm one voice. It doesn't matter as long as the press is listening to me. And the press will soak this stuff up. They want to hear from you all the time. Um, and uh, I guarantee you reporters would be glad to come sit in my office and let me talk to them about a lot of these issues facing the Railroad Commission. When they talk to industry groups, what kind of an agenda do they put forward? Rah-rah, uh, oh, vote for me? Yeah, what? It's, um, it's rah rah. It's um, how good things are, or <laughs> here's what we're doing good for you, or. Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things they touted uh, the last time was how fast they were issuing permits. Oh, okay. And in fact, I still hear the current the guy, the Republican that's running for the position I am, still wants to be faster. Well, the average time's like three days. I'm going. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, you know, this is just crazy. It's just crazy. Um, but they don't have any incentive to talk to anybody else. There's no political incentive for them to do that. So we as voters have allowed them to get away with it. And we as voters are going to have to ch have to change it. Okay. One of the things that back to fracking for just a little bit. <clears throat> I happen to know somebody that was um, works down at the Ship Channel. And I can't remember what the percentage was, but some large percentage of bulk shipments that are coming into the port of Houston are sand. Yes. Why is that? Why, why, do, we, why do we have to go around the world to get sand to do the fracking? Oh, it, it may not be coming from around the world. It may be coming from uh, the Great Lakes area. Oh. So it's not necessarily coming from around the world. It might be. I, I oh, really okay. don't yeah, know. I just, uh, but there's, there's sand... Well, first of all, there it, must be different kinds of sand. There is different kinds of sand, and there's different sizes, and it has to be processed, and it, you just—it's just not sand. I mean, they—they—they—they <laughs> they, 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 they talk about the mixture, for example, 1040, 2080. You know, there's lots of different mixtures oh, okay. that you would use uh, that are different mesh sizes that people have found is optimal to hold that that crack open, and you use sand because it's cheap. Right, it's it's inexpensive compared to other things like ceramics, which are another thing people use, but they tend to be a, a lot more expensive. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I I doubt it's coming from 
all, all around the world. It might be. Some might be coming I from just, Mexico. Uh, I, I, it's just. I guess it never occurred to me where the sand might be coming from. Yeah, well, there's a lot of it. Sand comes, is such just a, a ubiquitous commodity that I you know, thought you'd just go out and dig it up well, out of the ground. I, I bet there's a lot of it coming in by rail car as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, of course, it's being brought into some place like Houston because that's the central point where people would haul their sand out to the sites. In other right. words, that's where they would manage it yeah. from, where your right. central storage facilities. And there, there's huge piles of the sand, huge piles. <laughs> the, the amounts are unbelievable. Uh, it's not unusual. San, maybe Saudi Arabia has an advantage on us well, in uh, fracking. Let, let me give you a number. <laughs> let me give you a number that'll kind of blow your mind. There, it's not unusual for a well, a modern fracked well, to inject 10 million pounds of sand. In the frack job, mm. ten million pounds of sand. My God, that's a lot of sand. How many railroad cars is that? Do you know? <laughs> uh, it's about fifty dump. Uh, even a smaller ones. Uh, that one's probably more like a hundred dump trucks. Oh wow! And so when when people object to them fracking next door to you, that's the reason because you got big trucks. Oh, that's how the and they're roads all get coming uh, in. Torn oh, up, huh? That's how the roads got torn up. That's right. That's how the roads got torn up. Okay, hmm. interesting. You have anything else railroad commission wise, uh, Alan, or should we switch to Libertarian Party issues? Or well, what about the uh, the concept of private property rights? I mean, uh, this is this is. Uh, uh, seems like an issue that uh, you're concerned about. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it is. Um, there's there's sort of three aspects to it. I'll. I'll I'll come on to one of them that I think is probably the most important. One of them is the competition between surface rights and mineral rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is issues around eminent domain with common carriers pipelines. And the other one is situations about what do you do in living, like cities, places where people live and work. But let me talk about the surface and mineral rights. Um, unfortunately, we allowed surface rights to be severed from mineral rights many, many decades ago. So it is possible for you to own the surface and me to own the subsurface. In Texas, and I, I think it's by common law, not by statute, mineral rights are dominant over surface rights. That means if you own the mineral rights and you lease them to an oil company and I own the surface rights, I can't keep you from allowing that resource to be produced. Uh, that you, I must allow them on my property. Now they're required to do minimum damage and so on and so forth, but I can't stop you. And so I have no recourse, and in fact I have no way of even necessarily getting paid for it if they don't want to. Now a lot of the more responsible companies don't like people raising a stink, and they'll, you know, they'll pay some money to, but a lot of the less responsible companies don't, and they don't have to. So you've got automatically got a conflict here because you would have the right to get the economic value of your minerals. That is your right. They're your minerals. You, you, they belong to you. On the other hand, I have a right on the surface to the quiet enjoyment of my property. So this is what I mean by when rights start to conflict, and there's that's just a conflict, period. I don't know how you deal with it. I got a few ideas that I think are worth discussing, some of which I've talked to an economist at the Cato Institute about. He kind of liked them. I'd like to talk to an attorney sometime, and I will, about how you can begin to balance those a little bit. Some of the states actually require certain kinds of payments. I think the service owner ought to share in the royalties in some manner. He at least give you, you may still not like it, but at least give you some money. You know, at least give you some, something for the fact that you had to go along with this with this deal, Hope, hopefully negotiated. I would always prefer you have statutes that encourage negotiation as opposed to requiring an outcome. And I, but I don't know exactly how that would happen. But that's that's just a built-in problem. Today it's worse than ever. When we were drilling out in West Texas, those ranchers they owned both. And when they came on, I heard this from ranchers a lot. If it wasn't for oil and gas, I couldn't be a rancher because I get a royalty check. So th that pump jack that's out in their field with the thing around it and the cows, they're happy. You need a road? No problem, you know, because <laughs> I'm getting a royalty check every month. But if you're not getting a royalty check every month and there's a pump jack on your property, you're not very happy at all, right? You ha you get nothing for that. And so I, th I think that's someplace there's, there's a role for government to do something. 
I don't know exactly what that should be. The Railroad Commission actually has no power to do that. Uh, the Railroad Commission has really dominance over the subsurface, not the surface. Hmm. Something related to that, which might be what you're getting to a little bit, is the Denton fracking ban that mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now been sort of gone away. And there was a bill called House Bill 40 that basically got rid of the Denton fracking ban. What D Denton did was said no fracking in city limits, which basically meant no drilling in city limits, which basically meant I'm taking away your, your uh, subsurface rights because you can't produce it otherwise. So, th and it was going to court. They would have lost because there have been several cases in Texas that, that, the, that the courts have always sided with. It's a taking. It's a taking. Um, clearly a taking. In other words, you, didn't, you haven't reduced the value. You've made it zero. <laughs> yes. So, but the legislature couldn't resist. They were pissed. So they came in and passed House Bill 40, which now it's even worse. Cities have less power now than they did before House Bill 40. So Denton actually made it worse for the cities. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's unfortunate. The cities, it needed to be a little bit better. They needed to have a little more. And, and again, I don't know how you do this. I talked to a guy who was the former uh, equivalent of a railroad commissioner in, in Colorado. And he was instrumental in helping them ca pass a law in which the cities and the companies are basically highly encouraged to come up with some kind of MOU. In other words, they're encouraged to make an agreement. Don't come to the commission, make an agreement. And he says it's been working okay. You know, they, there's some compromises that are made. I talked to, during the House Bill 40 uh, conference, I talked to the city attorney from Grand Prairie. He was testifying against it. And he said, yeah, he said, we're an industrial city. We have lots of oil and gas. And he said, frankly, it took us a couple of years to negotiate the regs because it was, it, he said, it was hard. And I said, well, isn't this really a conflict between surface rights and subsurface rights? He said, absolutely, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> and so he said, we tried to figure out how to make that work for Grand Prairie. And he said, what works in Grand Prairie might not work in Denton, but it worked. And so they did things like um, post bonds for the roads and took pictures. So that when they were coming to drill a well, they told them what roads they could use, took pictures, post bonds, and then looked at the roads afterwards. And if the roads were damaged, they took some of that money and fixed the roads. And there were restrictions on when they could truck in things. And so they, they did something that worked for Grand Prairie. Mm -hmm. that's good. And that's the kind of stuff, those negotiated sort of things is what we need to get to somehow. And um, it's not easy. You know, if you're a property, if you're a surface owner, you just don't want drilling, period. And if you're a mineral rights owner, you say, oh, what? you can't stop me. So it's tough. Well, all right. I think we've covered a lot of uh, the issues that uh, Railroad Commission would uh, certainly be involved in, and we both uh, wish you the best, of Thank course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to just switch us a little bit to uh, the implications for the Libertarian Party. Uh, you're the, there's only one statewide ticket other than the judicial races, I think. That's right. The, That's right. You're the candidate, and there's some implications about uh, the ballot status for the party associated with that, right? There, there are. Um, Texas law requires for a party to retain ballot access, uh, it must get at, in at least one statewide office 5% uh, of the votes cast. Um, normally we get to our 5%, when I say normally, over the last few cycles, we've gotten to that 5% because the Democrats haven't run somebody for several of the judicial offices. And consequently, people that believe they have to vote for somebody will pull the lever for a libertarian. And so we've gotten well past our, our 5%. This cycle, the Democrats have run somebody in every single judicial race, uh, of course, as, as well as railroad commissioner, which is the only executive position on the ballot. And I always tell people, remember, the railroad commission is on the ballot every two years because mm -hmm. there's, there's three of them on rotating schedules. And consequently, it's going to be more difficult for us to get, it's sort of not going to be kind of automatic to get to the 5%. Uh, I ran in 2014 for the position, did not run a terribly aggressive campaign, but did my best to stay in Did front. you have your book out in 2014? I did not. I okay. did not. In fact, a lot of the things that are in the book are things that I wrote in 2014 on my blog. And so that's what every good author does is, you know, 
pulls in stuff they've already written to kind of, as well as stuff I, I wrote when I was at the university. Um, so, uh, so I ran 2014. I tried to stay in front of the media. Got some, a little bit of media attention, but it was hard. It's hard for a libertarian to get a lot of media mm -hmm. attention. Um, and I pulled better than anybody else for the Libertarian Party. I pulled a little over 3% of the vote. So the, the 5% is in our reach. Sure. And uh, consequently, uh, I've put together a, a very, with the help of my campaign manager, of course, a very uh, active campaign. We're raising some good money. We've raised, we're, I think we're pushing $20,000, which of course won't get anything close to the Republicans. Uh, we've got a few big donors that have expressed some interest that perhaps they'll come up with some money to help us get the okay. word out. So, But we have some challenges. And uh, one of them is, one of them we talked about is, excuse me, people don't know what the Railroad Commission is and that they should even pay attention to it. Right. And so part of the reason for writing the book was to get people to pay attention to right. the race in and of itself. Well, are the people that uh, won't read the book, which I assume will be a fairly that'll be a, healthy... Yeah, it'll be a large <laughs> number. Yes, people. indeed. Uh, you know, my uh, first thought was, well, let's just go with it. Let them think it's the Railroad Commission. And you... Uh, appear as a railroad engineer and say you're the only engineer that uh, is be. capable of running the Railroad Commission. One of the issues we face in Texas is straight ticket voting. 60% uh, yes. of the votes in Texas are cast really? straight ticket. Okay. Um, Texas is only one of nine states that still allow it. And there are powerful, powerful forces in the legislature, including Harris County Clerk's Office, uh, who do not want to they like straight ticket voting. And that's one of the things that hurts us because people don't want to come in and they just want to pull the lever for a D or an mm. R. And of course, a lot of people think about the wasted vote syndrome. Sure. One of our opportunities, I believe, is, well, there's a couple of opportunities. One is, Railroad Commission is number third, it's the third line on the ballot this time. It's, it's up there, so people right. will see it. It'll be president, vice president, then your congressperson, and then railroad commissioner. So it will be seen. Uh, the trick is how do we get people to say, you know, I should vote L. I believe this is a year to say, folks, it's time to shake up the two-party problem. Mm -hmm. And if that's all you want to do is just make them shake the boots a I think there's bit. a lot of people that say, you know, not... Just, yeah, in your race, but obviously in the presidential uh, uh, race. In the presidential race. That are looking to shake up. So my argument is, look, you can shake up the, t and if perchance I got elected, I'd make a hell of a railroad commission. <laughs> so it's not it's not like I'm some screwball that, we, you know, I'm going to you know, exactly. make things really wacky at the railroad commission. Right. Um, so this is the time to do it. We may get some coattails from the presidential guy. I don't know. We'll see. Hard to tell. Don't know. But we, we do need, you're right, we do need to figure out how to, uh, to get the word out. Uh, maybe that's an idea that's probably worth pursuing. Yeah. It's, we'll it's, do that with you. It's about time for us to uh, wrap this conversation up. Uh, certainly appreciate uh, having you all here tonight. Uh, Alan, uh, good to welcome you uh, to this. Maybe we'll Thank get you, David. back together sometime. And Thank you, David. Mark, a pleasure to have you here, and we're certainly uh, rooting for you on the upcoming uh, upcoming election cycle and uh, wish you all the best and uh, wish the citizens of Texas all the best by having somebody qualified on the Texas Railroad Thank Commission. Thank you. So I just, if each one of your viewers would get a hundred of their friends to vote for me, we might, yeah. maybe we'll make a difference. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Enjoyed having you. Thank you.